like to welcome you all here tonight and we're slightly giddy. We just left um, Congress. We had an invitation here and ironically three years ago we came to Washington DC with this dream. We were uh, a meager class with an idea that we wanted to write and to, to use writing as a, a process of changing our lives and we would have never envisioned that Two years later, we would actually get an invitation from Dick Gephardt to go to a leadership conference with Congress. And sitting on one side of me was John Lewis, one of the original Freedom Riders, who our name takes homage. And he was crying. On the other side was Dick Gephardt, and he was crying. So we've got streaks of black mascara. It's because we spent a very emotional hour with Congress talking about change, instigating change, and hoping that when we left, they will be agents as well to carry this message of, of teaching people and um, truly making t tolerance a part of curriculums across this country. So what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about who we are and hear their voices. Our original subtitle was Voices from an Undeclared War. And the idea of war in America sometimes seems very foreign when we can turn on the television and look at situations like Bosnia or more recently Kosovo. And when I first began teaching with these students, they were 14 years old and they felt that they were, there was a war happening in their city. There was not tanks rolling down the streets of Long Beach, but there was gunshots at night, there was helicopters above their heads, and many of these students have lost several friends and family members to gang violence and also police violence. There's one young man in my class who lost 35 friends by the time he was 15. That to me is a war. So when I first began teaching, unfortunately, I brought with me um, a lot of stereotypes that I had been fed by the media and they brought their baggage. They had albatrosses around their necks. They had stereotypes fed to them as well. And we had just had the, the Rodney King riots in Los Angeles. So there was a lot of racial tension and incredible segregation. So I walked into this classroom, very idealistic and thinking I would try to change a few lives and walked into a classroom of disgruntled students. They were 14 and the commonalities they shared was that they didn't like reading, they didn't like writing, they didn't like each other, and more importantly, they didn't like me. So they had that going for them. Also in this classroom of, of 35 students, they separated themselves by race, unfortunately, which was something you could see in our very segregated city. So there was a pocket full of African Americans in one corner. Across from them was Latinos, Cambodians, and one lone Caucasian sitting in, in the corner, very timidly looking at his schedule, wondering, what the hell am I doing in here? I should be across the hall in the Distinguished Scholars Program. And unfortunately, in our school, in, in the 90s, and, and to this day, they did a, a horrific thing where they separated students based on the color of their skin. And so the students knew it, the teachers knew it, and walking into the school, I was immediately faced with this and all this other baggage. To add insult to injury, it was at the cusp of the gangster rap movement, and Snoop Doggy Dogg, who was kind of the founder and the Pied Piper, was from Long Beach. So all of these things about gangster rap and toting guns rather than pins had really reached its pinnacle. So initially, when I had this syllabus with all kinds of books like Shakespeare and all these great writing projects, and they looked at me with hate in their heart and hate in their eyes, and what are these uh, syllabi and, and was and paper airplanes? I realized that I was going to, have to throw these lesson plans out and start anew and really figure out a way how I could teach with them, truly empower them, engage them in the learning process, and make everything that we were doing feel like it was vital, that it had some kind of connection to their lives. Our rallying cry one day was when I decided to do a readathon for tolerance. When I heard the word undeclared war, I thought what I needed to do was to find books written by and about teenagers who were in situations where they were plagued by violence. Two books I chose was The Diary of Anne Frank and a book by a young girl in Sarajevo. And the irony of this, this young diarist from Sarajevo is she was nicknamed the modern day Anne Frank, whereas Anne Frank sat down and wrote to her diary in the attic. This young girl who was 11 years old sat down and started writing from her basement as bombs were falling above her head in Sarajevo and the Serbs and the Croats were fighting. When Slata Filipovic was 11, these young individuals were also 11 and they watched their city burn. They watched the Rodney King riots take place in their city. They were not allowed to go to school for several days and they truly changed the, the demographics and the, um, the makeup of the city. 
So initially, it was just a writing idea. I wanted them to read and then possibly write some exciting projects where they can see the parallels between themselves and these young diarists. What ended up happening was an incredible odyssey that is now in its fifth year. Because in reading these stories and hearing their stories tonight, they saw themselves in the pages of these books, in the pages of history. And they realized that unless we learn from history, that we're doomed to repeat it. And we were really fortunate to meet a Holocaust survivor who told us a profound quote, which is, evil prevails when good people do nothing. This is an example of good people who have decided to do something. And so with the inspiration of Anne and the inspiration of Slata, they too began to chronicle their lives, to essentially bear witness to the things that were happening in their city when they looked out their windows, out the bar wire, out of the bars, the graffiti on the street, started chronicling the things that were happening in their city, the, the loss of innocence per se. These Freedom Riders were very lucky to meet two people who essentially gave them the, the extra push that they needed to take their writing from the classroom, from being a classroom project, into making it a movement, a cause. The first woman was Meep Geese, the woman who ha helped Anne Frank and hid her in her attic. Meep Geese came to America solely to meet these young individuals. And as we sat awestruck by this diminutive woman who was 87 years old at the time, hearing the tale about what it was like to sacrifice everything for two years, essentially, to help these eight individuals, we sat there and were in awe of her courage and her sacrifice and her conviction. But the most incredible thing she said to these students was a challenge, and that was to make sure that Anne's memory and her death was not in vain. That Anne had one sole purpose, that she wanted to go on living even after her death. And it was up to these students, the next generation, the next heroes, to take that invisible pen and to start writing. And so in one fell swoop, there was this imaginary baton passed and this spirit resonating in this room of, of Anne that we had to do something as well to make sure that although she did not survive, that through her writing, she was immortal and that we would be the people who would pick up the baton and carry that voice. They also met Zlata Filipovich, a young girl from Sarajevo. She came over at 15 years old and taught us a valuable lesson that she in turn passed to them, and that was to continue to write, to have that commonality of the hu human spirit, to fight intolerance, to fight prejudice, to not look at groups and to label them as wholes. And from there, we decided that we too would write, but we needed a name, we needed a place to go, and that is where the Freedom Writers came from. We watched a video one day of our, our hero, John Lewis and the Freedom Writers, getting on a bus here in Washington, D.C., riding through the segregated South and deliberately challenging the laws of our country. These horrific laws that separated people of drinking fountains and not allowing them to sit together on this bus. Who would have thought that we would be sitting next to him today and, and, and paying him kudos and tributes that it was his courage as a young man at 21 years old that would inspire us to take that name and to, and to follow in his footsteps. In the spring of 1997, after we had had a visit from me, and Zlata, and this name, the Freedom Riders came to Washington, D.C. It was the first time they'd ever been in a plane. It was the first time they'd ever stayed in a hotel. And they came with a mission, and that was to challenge the Secretary of Education with their stories, with what was happening, what they call their America. But the most incredible thing happened after we gave our book to Secretary Riley. We had another stop to make, and that was to circle the Washington Monument. And the students wanted to have a candlelight vigil for peace, <coughs> paying tribute to all the friends and family that they knew who had lost their lives to senseless violence. Darius, the student I told you earlier, had 35 buttons from head to toe of friends and family that had been lost due to careless shooting on the street. And so we joined hands, left our hotel on Pennsylvania Avenue, and walked across the streets of Washington, D.C., and circled the Washington Monument. And as we were walking across the street, a very disgruntled Washingtonian, um, not used to being stopped by a group of teenagers, honked his horn and started yelling at us and asked simply, what are you doing? And there was a, a towhead among us who simply said, we're changing the world. And that, and that is essentially what became our next cause, is that not only could we stop traffic, but maybe for a moment we could stop racism. Maybe we could stop hatred in people's heart. Maybe just by the model that we were setting, the fact that all of these colorful people were holding hands and stopping everything around them. Maybe for one moment, somebody would listen. From there, the students felt that they brought their mes message to the nation's capital, but that wasn't enough. They had one last literary journey to, to take. 
So as they graduated, all three of these young individuals are the first in their families to graduate, the first in their families to enroll in college, and the first to have aspirations of having very powerful positions to really change their community. Maria wants to be the first Latina Secretary of Education. Sonia wants to be a publisher and, and change the book world, and Henry wants to be a professor. And they want to do it within our city. They want to make changes within Long Beach that can create a ripple effect. So after they graduated, enrolled in college, they spent a year becoming ambassadors of tolerance, working with little kids in their community, teaching them how to read, teaching them how to care, teaching them how to see past skin color. And on August 4th, the day that Anne Frank was captured and essentially sent to her death at Bergen-Belsen, the Freedom Riders got on a plane, flew to Amsterdam, went to Anne Frank's attic, and paid tribute to this young girl who did continue to go on living even after her death. They also went to Auschwitz, joined hands on the, uh, on the railroad tracks that led into Birkenau, that sent millions and millions of people to their death at the crematoriums, joined hands, got on those railroad tracks, and walked through those gates, went to the crematoriums with Holocaust survivors, and made a tribute that these good people would not let evil prevail. And then last but not least, they went to Sarajevo. On the wake of Kosovo, on the wake of this horrific mass destruction and genocide, and met with Serbs, Croats, Muslims, and Albanians, and showed a lesson that, that peace is possible. It's difficult, it's hard, it's not going to happen overnight. But if we could do it, and we had four different gangs in our community, four different races, every economic level possible, that if 150 people could do it, quite possibly a few people in that room could do it. So we come to you tonight um, feeling on top of the world, just meeting our hero and hoping that we challenged uh, Congress. And the amazing thing is they sat there and cried and we cried and you may cry this evening as well. What we'd like to do is take you back on that literary journey and, and read you some stories of this incredible journey that I have a feeling, this sneaky suspicion that it's not over. It's, it's um, just begun in, in a certain sense. And what we'd like to hopefully encourage you as you're hearing the stories is to think about where this journey is for you. What we like to think about is that we feel like we're members of a relay team. Anne Frank's message, the most poignant and powerful, was truly that first leg. She was a leadoff runner with that baton in, in, the, in the shape of a pin. She in turn passed it to Zlata Filipovich in Sarajevo, who in turn passed it to the Freedom Riders. But you, the reader, are that fourth leg. And so we're hoping that as you read this book, that you have that inspiration to pick up a piece of paper, to buy a blank journal, and to start chronicling your life, the things that you see, fighting injustice, speaking out, and being those good people who truly make sure that evil does not prevail. So hopefully you'll be inspired tonight. And um, as we tell this wonderful tale, we'd like you to ask as many questions to see how this, this process can be duplicated. We're hoping that it can be a blueprint for all classrooms, for all students across this country to feel that they do have a voice, to feel that they can make a change and that they can dare to dream. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to take you back to that very first day when these 14-year-olds who were cantankerous and ornery and um, had never really understood the power of the pen walked into a classroom, saw this teacher who was a bad caricature of the SNL cheerleader from hell, thought, what the hell have we got ourselves into? How long is this class? When can we go to the next class? So I'd like to introduce Maria Reyes, who's going to take you back to diary entry number one, day one, 1994. The first few months were very difficult. How do you teach Shakespeare to a bunch of students who've never read a book? It's not savvy to, to bring homework home. And so little by little, I had to chip away at the veneer, crush the facade. And we were really fortunate that we were able to find some community support. There was an incredible benefactor who found out that, lo and behold, the Ku Klux Klan was after me in my community because I was trying to help some of these students. So he said, how can I help you? And I said, well, I would, I would love to start getting some resources. I don't have books. I don't have supplies. I don't even have resources to take these kids on a field trip. So I was really fortunate this man said, I'll help you. And so one of our first projects was to read a book and to create a panel about diversity, looking at people who look like them, talk like them, came from where they came from, and it went on to aspire to incredible things. And so this is a story about going to, on this incredible field trip, being treated like your bell of the ball, and having somebody who has more power than Midas, 
who didn't care about the power, but cared about the young human lives he was molding and touching. So this is an incredible story of how these freshmen slowly started to change and soften up and start realizing there were people out there who cared about them. So I'd like to introduce Sonia. So after this chaotic year of teaching these freshmen, we were given this incredible gift of having them again. And so first I thought, do I, do I really want them? One more year, here's a chance for my clean getaway. And I was inches from sneaking away and I thought, they are incredible. They, they do have um, that incredible gift to make me laugh, and they're ornery, but they keep me on check. So I'll stick it out for one more year, and then I'm going to hightail it out of there. And amazingly enough, that, that second year is when everything changed. It was this incredible number 15. And, and being an English major, and all of you that love to read and, and love metaphors and similes and analogies, there was so much symbolism that happened in this project that I know that there's got to be some kind of divine intervention that's intervening in this, this crusade. Because something incredible happened with this age of 15. Anne Frank, like I said earlier, was 15, thinking she was on the cusp of freedom, thinking that she was going to change the world. And yet her words immortalized the struggle. And when people think of the Holocaust, they picture Anne Frank's face. Ellie Wiesel was 15 during the Holocaust, and we read the book Night, and we learned about Auschwitz. We learned about this horrific man's inhumanity to man. Slata Filipovich was 15, and all of a sudden we learned that people had not learned the lessons from the past, that people were killing one another miles and miles away on foreign soil over things like skin color, over last names, over religion. They were 15. And so at 15 years old, we did this toast for change, and we wiped the slate clean. And each of these young people stood around in a circle, held hands, and got a plastic champagne glass filled with sparkling apple cider. And it was amazing to, to give these students the opportunity to wipe that slate clean, really liberated all of these deep, dark secrets that they held in the, the back of their heads. And to see big, strong track stars and football players crying for the first time and feeling like there is hope. And that's what gave us the courage, I think, to reach out and to try to find this woman, Meet Peace, to come and to tell us about Anne's story, about her strife, and to let her know how deeply and profoundly she affected us. So Sonia's going to read a story about what it was like to actually meet Meet Peace, a, tr a true hero in our, our midst. Henry is going to share the next story, which is actually a letter that was written to Zlata Filipovich in an attempt to try to woo her to come and visit us. And initially, it was an idea that I had, crazy scheme to think outside of the box, um, to get my students to want to write uh, something different than the standardized five-paragraph essay. So the scheme was, if they sit down and write a letter and they envision Zlata and they can make all these great parallels, that they'll write these incredible stories, and then I'll, I'll give them back and we'll have a star or a score and, and we'll move on to the next project. And one day, a young man came to class and he was sobbing. He had just lost two of his friends. And all of a sudden, I realized that this, this letter could not be something that would get a number, be returned, and then move on to the next project that this letter had to be an invitation. It had to ask this young girl to come to our country. Even though we had no money, most of the students were on some kind of federal assistance and free lunch programs. But somehow, some way, we were going to contact this young refugee and bring her to America. And I think the fear in the back of my head is since we live in Los Angeles, we're surrounded by all these obnoxious Hollywood kids who end up dying their hair magenta or in some kind of drug rehab program. So I thought, oh my God, what if we do find her? She's got an attitude or she's got an entourage and she'll have a posse. And, you know, if we do bring her, do we have to bring all of her people? And, um, and if we do contact her, how are we going to afford it? I can't even afford to buy books, let alone plane tickets and um, hotels. But sure enough, with the passion that these students had, they raised the money. And an incredible thing happened. There was one young man about six foot seven, the star of our basketball team, and was so excited about the concept of bringing this book alive that one day, before we sent the letters out, he brought in this huge sparkling jug of water. It was empty. And I had visions of him getting on the bus at 6 a.m. and transferring to another bus at 6.30 and then the third bus at 7 a.m. and sauntering into the class with this big water uh, jug. And he announced to the class, this is what we were going to use to raise the money to bring Slot to here. And I was thinking, we need like 10 of those water jugs. And he reached in his pocket. I think he pulled out more lint than he did coins. And he put the lint and the coins in the jug. 
as if to emulate, this is what we need to do. This is what we all have to do is to reach in our pockets and start raising money to, to get her here. And he asked me one day, as, as the, the jug started to fill with a few nickels here, a couple dimes, a couple dollar bills, I was grew well, you know, what's going to happen if uh, we raise all this money and she doesn't come? And in my mind, I knew she wasn't going to come. I didn't know where she lived. I had no idea how to contact her. I didn't even know what language she spoke. For all intense purposes, she could be like Macaulay Culkin and obnoxious. Um, so I, I fumbled, and when you're a teacher, you have to think fast on your feet. And I said, well, if she doesn't come, think of all the money we've raised. We can, we can go on more field trips. We can buy more books. And then I stopped, and I thought, but if she does come, your lives will never be the same. And their lives have never been the same because it was the power of a letter like this written by this young man that encouraged Latu, who was as genuine and as sweet-natured as anyone we've ever met, to come and to learn about our America, about our undeclared war, and to hear these voices. And so Henry's going to read a story written by a former gang member, uh, a football player, who admittedly had never read a book until he was forced to read Anne Frankenstein's Filipovich's book on restriction because he couldn't leave his room and the TV was taken away. And it was this letter that was the first letter that Zlata Filipovich read and part of the catalyst that brought her to us. So I'd like to introduce Henry Jones. When Zlata came, something incredible happened. We were invited to the former Yugoslavian club that was adjacent to our city. And all we knew about this war is what we were reading in Vanity Fair and watching on CNN about good guys and bad guys. And we were invited to a club that had been the Yugoslavian club, and all of a sudden it was splintered, and it was the Croatian Hall. And people now were no longer Yugoslavian. They were Croats or Serbs or Muslims. And what the club did not know that the Freedom Riders were privy to was that Zlata was biracial and that she brought her best friend, who was also a different race, Zlata's father being Muslim, her mother being a Croat, and her best friend being Serbian. So we sat in this incredible, incredible place with all of these educators and lawyers and doctors and very educated people who were very proud Croats. And somebody put Zlata on the spot as she was giving a speech, this beautiful 15-year-old, very poised and, and, and dignified, and said, so Zlata, what are you? Failing to realize that her girlfriend, her best friend who came with her was Serbian, and her parents sitting there were Muslim and Croat, respectively. And we all got kind of nervous because we knew what he wanted. Like we all know, when you, when you see a ballot and you've got to check your ethnicity, check Caucasian, African American, or other, what is that? So we all knew, we had that nervous tension. What was she going to say? And by saying what she was, was she going to denounce her friend? Was she going to buy into the silliness? And it took this, this young sage, this 15-year-old, to look out into the audience look at the man who asked the question and very courageously say, I'm a human being. And I think for all of us, that's what really, it really meant to become a freedom writer, to look past color, to look past race, and to simply be human beings. That when we see those boxes on the ballots or applications and we're supposed to check something, it offends us, as it, offend, it should offend us all, because we are human beings. And we should be able to be in, an, in a generation where we should see past it. The next story is going to be about coming to Washington, D.C. and being on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and feeling the power and the strength of Martin Luther King's message and what it was like to be together with 150 freedom writers, 30 adults, to look out onto the city, to look out onto your city, and to really feel what Martin Luther King must have felt in his heart and shared with the world. So I'd like Henry to read that story as well. As they returned to their city, feeling they had conquered the world, they realized that in order to make a change, that it had to come through education. And so the next story is about the fears and the trepidation and, and the sheer excitement of education when it had always seemed like something that was unobtainable. And so as we returned and we were able to stay together for one last year as a senior class, the Freedom Riders started thinking about financial aid forms, college life, the freshman 15, what is all of these crazy myths we see on television, and is it obtainable? Can we actually do it? So Maria chose a story to read that she can identify with because she is the first in her family to go to school. She's the one that's going to transform her younger sister, her cousins. And the most incredible thing about Maria 
is with her strength and her passion, she stood in this room. You would have been blown away. I felt like this proud mother. We were in Congress, and all of these uh, congressmen who you, you see on CNN, and um, it was this eerie feeling of deja vu. Maria, who's this little spitfire, stood there, had them sobbing, and told them, she challenged them that she's going to take Secretary Riley's job, and she means it passionately, and she will. But more importantly, she told a story about where she was and where she is. At 11 years old, Maria got brutally jumped into a gang. That was all she knew. And she told Congress that her father was in a gang. Her father had been in prison for 15 of her first 18 years. And when, Re when Maria realized the power of education, her father got out of the gang, got out of prison, and she encouraged him to enroll in junior college. And she is now his tutor. And so I think that just says a, a great tribute about when you, when you do believe in education, when you do believe you can do it. So Maria's gonna read a story about a classmate of hers that also believed that education was possible. What I'd like to do now is we're gonna tell a few anecdotes that are part of the book and to share some of the um, enthusiasm that they hopefully um, were able to instill in Congress today. But one of the most miraculous stories, I, I think, um, of this book was the idea of, of seeing yourself in the pages of a book and, and, and really realizing that universality of the human spirit. And so Maria was probably the toughest nut to crack. She came into my class, like I said, because a probation officer brought her. There was no apples, and if there were apples, there were probably razor blades in the apples. So she definitely was not a student that was cleaning on the chalkboards and asking if she could carry the books to my car each day. When we started this, <laughs> She may be small, but she's mighty. Um, and if any of you have seen Austin Powers, she's now, we, we call her Mini-Me. She's my little Mini-Me. But originally, before she had this incredible metamorphosis, when we were going to start this Toast for Change, and I brought out these four books, and Frank being the thickest, it was not something that, that Maria embraced with loving arms, the idea of having to read. No cliff notes, no photographs, for crying out loud. And... She is, I think, the embodiment of Anne Frank's spirit. And I'd like her to share what uh, the, the story uh, of Anne Frank, how it changed her, and what it did to her as a person, and how she was able to make people like Dick Gephardt cry with this story. So I'd like to have her share this incredible, incredible inspiration with you. The next person I'd like to have share an anecdote is Sonia. And Sonia was one of those people who also was transferred in because of this crazy assessment test these eighth grade students took that separated them from their peers, also because of the color of their skin. And Sonia is an immigrant to this country. I tease her that she's now Doogie Hauser because she graduated two years younger than all her peers. But when she came to this country, she didn't speak English. And it was really difficult for her to take standardized tests and she overcame that. And now, ironically, she wants to be a publisher. She wants to write. Uh, there's never a day that goes by that she doesn't have a pen in hand in her journal, and she's writing passionately away. And when we returned from Washington, D.C., I had told the students that someday little kids were going to look up to her and the Freedom Riders. And I had just returned from this all-night craze of, of watching TV, and there was a commercial where it had uh, young kids pretending that they were Tiger Woods and they were swinging these golf clubs and all these little kids were saying, I'm Tiger Woods, I'm Tiger Woods. And so I told Sonia's class, you know, someday there's going to be little kids that are going to say, I'm a freedom rider. And I think it was Sonia said, you know, Ms. Gruel, stop going to Starbucks on your way to school. You've had way too many lattes, you're a little highly strong. And I said, no, it can, it can happen. We got an invitation to go to a school adjacent to the toughest park in our community, Martin Luther King Park. And I sent Sonia as the Pied Piper, leading the troops, to go to the school and to teach them tolerance. So I'd like Sonia to tell what it was like to go, be a teacher for a day, to expand on that, what it was like to be a teacher for a day when their book came out, and then more recently, what it was like when they actually went to a prison. So I'd like Sonia to tell what it was like planting the seed that someday little kids were going to say, I want to be a freedom writer. Her denouncing it and saying, yeah, you've had way too much caffeine, and actually the reality of the situation. I'd like to ask Henry to, to share a poem 
that he read to Secretary Riley and um, to share a story about how the words in this poem have now transcended into his classroom. And then we're going to open it up to questions. But the incredible thing about Henry, come on up here, is that the first time I, I took Henry home, Henry was so unbelievably nonchalant and blasé that he lived in a two-story house, and the house beneath him was a crack dealership. And I was going to take him down this alley, and he told me not to drive too slow. I, they call me driving Miss Daisy sometimes because I have the reputation of driving really slow. So he said, this time, his girl, haul ass. I said, okay, Henry. And the fact that Henry was so blasé about that, and so many kids are, because that's what they see on a day-to-day -day basis, and they come to accept it. And the incredible thing is they don't have to. They shouldn't have to. We, as, as educators and as adults, should start challenging people that these kids should not be numb. They should not be anesthetized to, to violence and to drugs and accepted as commonplace because it should not be commonplace. So I think Henry's really learned a profound lesson that just the way uh, things are does not necessarily mean that's the way things should be. And they're trying to change things to really make things be better. So he's going to read a poem that was read to Secretary Riley and share how this message went into that house and actually transformed his, his young brother. I get to travel with them. I feel like I'm the luckiest person. Like I feel like I'm with the in crowd. So they have all these like cool nicknames. And yesterday, I got a cool nickname, too. <laughs> so they're Boo, and I'm, I'm Mama Boo. So it made me feel that I was, I was part of the in crowd. Um, we could share anecdotes ad nauseum, and um, I think that we, we should open up the floor for questions because we have so much to say, and I'm sure you have so much to ask, and we would really like, um, like I said, to have you be that, that, next, uh, that next writer, that next author, the next person who sparks the flame or is the catalyst for change. These are the Rosa Parks, the John Lewises, and um, we're hoping that there's more out there. If, if there's more Rosa Parks and more John Lewises, what an incredible planet we'll live on. And going into this next millennium, I'm, I'm not one of those people who's caught up in the whole Y2K paranoia. <laughs> I'm, I'm more concerned about, um, do our kids safe at night? Are they warm? Do they have enough money for, to, you know, to buy lunch? Those are the problems that I care about. And, and I'm hoping that this book will, will teach a child that's at home it's always kind of felt, I'm on the fringe, kind of on the margins of society, and I don't fit in. But wow, there's somebody in, in Long Beach, California, who shares my story, who also was molested, who also has parents on drugs, who also knows what it's like to have electricity turned off, who also knows what it's like to feel lonely and that they don't fit in. And so that, to me, is the most incredible thing to think about going into this millennium. It's not whether or not our computers aren't going to work. But that interaction, that human spirit, and that, that universality that really transcends everything, modern technology, that, that simple stuff, the hugs, the seeds, and opening up those cages. So I saw a gentleman with his hand up. So I'd like to open up the, the floor to questions. But before I do that, um, since I now have this cool nickname, I feel that I uh, must, once again, say that these are, are truly the real, real heroes that Meep Geese said they would be. Uh, people do want to be freedom writers. I, I'm an honorary freedom writer. I'm not as cool as they are, and I'm not a freedom writer. But I feel that I'm at least lucky to kind of hang out with them, and maybe through osmosis, it'll rub off on me. But I'd really like to, to have you join me in congratulating these incredible young people as they make their tour around this country and, and, and really challenge people in positions of power. There was no smooching today. When they were in, in Congress, they kept it real, they kept on their, their eye on the prize, and... Um, and I think there, there's got to be a buzz up on that hill right now because we left with them wanting more. And like I said, John Lewis said, like I said, I was holding his hand. I was, I was, you know, getting all excited. And John said, this is what it means to be a freedom writer. It, it made him inspired. He, and he got up in front of all of these people and said, we're here at a leadership meeting to learn how to be leaders. Here are the leaders.